Добро вечер. Бонсуар, good evening. I will immediately go into English um because since uh, many people here are uh, neither French nor Croatian or Serbian, so as to be understandable to all of you. Uh, first of all, I guess this is probably one of the rare instances or uh, moments that uh, theorist or Bruno Latour has to compete with the house party on the roof of a museum. I hope this is also a kind of experiment, so let's see how it goes. And if someone of you is here by mistake, wants to go there, I hope Bruno will be uh, funny enough, entertaining enough for you to stay here with us for the, for the lecture, and then afterwards, I hope also fruitful Q&A. First of all, I have to, uh, to say that the very immediate reason uh, we have invited Bruno Latour to come to Belgrade and Zagreb in 2017 is a book, is a translation of a book of, by Bruno Latour published in two, 2015 by our friends from uh, Belgrade, from a faculty of media and communication. They have done a great job in translating a major volume, a major restatement by Bruno Latour, the book on the inquiry on the modes of existence. And uh, this was for us, both our friends in Belgrade, most specific Alexandra Prole, who is with us, who is the editor-in-chief of the publishing program of the FMK Belgrade, and us here to, to have Bruno invited to come here. As you have probably seen, we also have, just on the occasion of this, of this uh, events, in Belgrade and Zagreb, he also published two volumes, kind of introductory volumes to, to the thinking and the projects of Bruno Latour. One, published by FMK Belgrade, is rather dealing with the, let's say, the canonical or the classical Bruno Latour of the actor network theory, also his uh, relationship or his discussion with Peter Sloterdijk, among others. And what we have done in Zagreb was to publish Bruno Latour's introductions into three of his exhibitions he has done since 2002 at the ZKM, so Zentrum für Kunst und Medientechnologie at Karlsruhe in Germany. And uh, I would say we had also a very peculiar reason why we have chosen to do this small, or rather it has become a thick volume of introductions uh, to the catalogs of those three respective exhibitions, because we think, or not just think, we, we know that the person who is most responsible for the ZKM to be, and also who is a spiritus movens, spiritus rector of the ZKM, Peter Weibel is also a person closely connected, I would say, with, uh, with many things that had happened, especially in Zagreb and the arts world of Zagreb since the 1960s. So in a way, it was, uh, we thought it would be interesting to, to have it combined and also to have Bruno Latour talking about exhibitions in a museum. So without further ado, I, uh, I hope you will help me welcome Bruno Latour to Zagreb. After the lecture, it should be a, around 40 to 45 minutes we will have then uh, Q&A. So please, help me welcome Bruno Latour. <laughs> Mama had a nice idea, as Peter nicely said, to link this free exhibition, but I have to warn you that I'm not an artist and I'm not a curator. I was a curator because I was interested in two things. One of them was to begin to understand contemporary art, and it seems to me that the only way to do field work in contemporary art was to work with artists uh, and with curators. Uh, and the other thing was uh, what I called with Peter Weiber um, a thought exhibition, which is slightly different from Mislina is lost B, which is not thought about the experiment, about the exhibition, and I have to explain what it is. Thought experiment 
in science is a very traditional way of understanding um, a situation where you don't have the actual experimental apparatus to do the experiment. So you imagine that if you were in a situation which will, might be in the future, you would obtain this or that result. Einstein is famous for having done a, a thought experiment where he imagined he's a photon and trying to understand what the world would look like if, I, if he was a photon. Of course, he couldn't be a photon, but it was very useful for him to understand what, could future, ex what future experiment could actually detect once uh, the experiment in a more mundane and material way would be available. And this is a very powerful uh, way to understand, I think, exhibition. So my talk is about exhibition as a genre, as a, as a media, if you want, like video or theater, but also about what can be done uh, with it um, in this very uh, interesting place which is uh, ZKM. So I've, I've explored three different uh, topic, uh, thought exhibition, which is topics which cannot possibly be done in any realistic way. So one of them was making things, what first iconoclash, which I will explain, was about the critique, basically, of the whole apparatus of critique in all sorts of domain. The second one was uh, about politics, an alternative way of understanding what politics was uh, about. And the third one, the first one was in 2002, the, this one was in 2005, and uh, this one is uh, last year in uh, Karlsruhe Reset Modernity, which is, of course, impossible to reset modernity for real, but you can do a little experiment in a closed space, and that's what we can do with uh, ex exhibition. The nice thing with exhibition is that it's an experiential space. And of course, it's a thing where you don't control exactly na naturally how people will behave uh, in it. As everybody knows, you need a space. And the space, in this case, is a very interesting space, which is this old factory in ZKM, a military factory, actually. Karlsruhe was bombed for during the war but because it was a very important factory. But none, none of the bombs that destroyed Karlsruhe actually destroyed this uh, plant, which was then restored at the end of the, uh, of the war. And what is amazing in Karlsruhe, which is largely because of Peter Weibel's uh, amazing uh, energy and uh, charisma, he has an incredible staff. And you, you know, which is, of course, why when you are a philosopher, it's very nice to do exhibition is because you are suddenly not isolated into your own uh, office and books, but you suddenly are like uh, in theater or in cinema with a large staff of uh, interesting people. But what I try to do in this free experiment is to share the curatorship with uh, different people because I thought, and every time we had two, sometimes three years of, of, of work, and the one I'm now planning uh, in 2019 will be again two years, where we co-curate uh, in order to make the place where we'll, uh, we will have the audience at the end into a sort of quasi-experimental uh, laboratory, following the parallel, if you want, with um, thought uh, experiment. And that's what we did with um, Iconoclash, which was my first attempt. I, I knew nothing about curatorship, so I had to um, share it and learning. And every one of these people had uh, one of the parts of the pot. The idea being that when uh, we deal with uh, the iconoclastic gesture, the iconoclastic tradition, uh, there is a strange phenomenon which we wanted to uh, realize in the space of the exhibition, which I call the suspension of our iconoclastic uh, gestures. Because the same gestures, the same people who believe that, for instance, religion is easy to criticize, would say science should not be criticized. And those who criticize science would say, well, that politics is easy to criticize, and so on and so forth. So we wanted to bring together all of the different history of iconoclastic gestures in the past in this uh, exhibition, which would, of course, be interested simultaneously into the Maoist revolution, into the uh, destruction of images by uh, the beginning of the Islamic movement in 2001, that's what the destruction of uh, Buddha there, but also the older tradition 
of destroying images in the Reformation or in the Revolutionary uh, War. The idea being to bring together um, all of the iconoclastic gestures and to test in the public if, for instance, this one you find it offensive or if you find it okay, but this one you find it destructive. And of course, in science, there is a long tradition of iconoclasm and respect for image which run against many other uh, alternative uh, tradition. So the, the whole thing was to bring, and, and again, the, there is uh, an, a sort of a link in an exhibition, an affair, and it was the same thing. People move around in the space which is organized by the curator, but they basically do their shopping around, and it's not always and not necessary to control the movement of the, the people. But the fair was built in such a way that everyone coming into the show was or could be shocked to see that people had attacked their own icon, so to speak, and happy to see that their, the fetish of some other had been destroyed. Except your icon is my fetish, or sorry, my, my fetish uh, is your icon. And, and, and the contradiction in the space, and it's very difficult to do that with another medium, because you need to build the space where you travel through these different uh, sort of uh, experiment. This was a, a famous uh, Max Dean uh, destroying of images, which you, some of you, I'm sure, can uh, would know. And the idea was that by doing this, uh, creating this space, we could renew this very important resource, which is uh, the, the resource of constructivism. And um, this is very nicely summarized in this fable by La Fontaine. Même l'on dit que l'ouvrier eut à peine achevé l'image, qu'on le vit frémir le premier et redouter son propre ouvrage. Here you see, oops, here you see uh, a sculptor who is uh, very surprised by the fact that he has done these Zeus's. But what is funny is that Zeus seems to be also very surprised to see his maker. And the link between maker and creature is, of course, one of the great puzzle and uh, enigma or mystery of art production. And the word constructivism doesn't, of course, pay justice to the difficulty of understanding the relation between creature and creature. And of course, in the history of Reformation itself, and there was a large part on the history of Reformation for uh, Joseph Kerner, who is the great historian of the breaking of uh, images, we, we had this constant paradoxes, uh, which is, for example, here, this is an anti-Catholic uh, uh, print, but which is also a, a fantastic images in its own uh, right about what it is to destroy images. Here you see people destroying, uh, believing in images. So it's an it's a iconoclastic gestures, which is itself produced in an iconophilic genre and in an amazingly powerful and beautiful uh, print. And that's the sort of paradoxes which we multiply in the different domain of religions in art and in uh, science because, as I'm sure many of you know, I cannot reconstruct the experiment here. It will take too much time. But we are very ambivalent about the destruction of images. We, we simultaneously always hold so completely different regi register one of them is to say, if only we could read of images, we would have direct access to truth, basically, to politics or art or religion or science. But also, simultaneously, without images, we could not reach neither art nor religion nor science. So that's why there's a sort of always this ambivalent, which is recognized in every religious conflict, but you recognize it everywhere, also in the history of art, of course, is this constant uh, uncertainty about uh, images and, and the power of iconoclasm. That's why the exhibition was called Iconoclash and not Iconoclasm, because the iconoclasm is pursuing the iconoclastic gestures until the end, but Iconoclash is the suspension of its gestures and say, wait a minute, what is actually do done when you hold the hammer of critique onto something that people say is a, a fetish, but which is also the icon of someone else. So destroying the fetish and destroying the icon of someone else is, of course, something that puts you immediately in a state of war and a 
the most of the emotion which have been studied in this uh, experiment are, of course, very old. I mean, they go all the way from the second commandment to uh, critique in the intellectual sense of the word. I put this image here, not to show how, age, how aged I have, but because I give to people the PDF of the iconoclast catalog, if they send me an email, it's an official pirating activity of mine because uh, the beautiful catalog is out of print and uh, it costs a fortune on eBay. And if you have a catalog, don't sell it because it's very, very expensive. I mean, or sell it if you are out of money. <laughs> so I send the catalog for free and I do also the same thing for the next one, but not the third one, it's still on print. Um, and that Peter Weibel, uh, it was of course 2001, 2002, so we were still close to, from the old immense history of the iconoclastic gesture, which has, had been going on, of course, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. And here you, you see the famous uh, two Russian artists who had uh, decided to show in Karlsruhe um, a very important icon of the uh, revolution, but coming from the DDR, actually. But of course, it was suspended, and it showed the future. But the wind moved the futures in one direction on to uh, another. So this is one, maybe in the discussion, we can talk about the usefulness of using this as a theme. I use it because, um, first, because it's in the book that Peter, uh, Peter uh, published, and also because you see that it's impossible to do that in another medium. Because it, you, can do that, you cannot do that on a book. You cannot do that on a I mean, in cinema, probably. But you need, you need to be able to build a space where people constantly experience the fact that their icon is mistreated, but that they are ready to mistreat because they call it a fetish, the icon of someone else. And if you build in, in, in a space this sort of constant reaction, uh, you, you begin to, to precisely to do the effect we wanted to obtain, that is the suspension of the iconoclastic just as the iconoclash, because there are lots of interesting features. We might get into that in the discussion around the set of passion which image have triggered, at least in the Western tradition, because of course it's not something that is uh, universal. The second exhibition uh, was very different, but again, I'm interested in showing it to you as a thought uh, experiment, as a thought exhibition. That was really a fair, and it was built like a fair with a very nice invention of those uh, little uh, partitions which were semi-transparent in the huge space of a ZKM. It was a fair, and in here I was the only uh, curator with uh, Peter Weibel, but what I'd done was to ask uh, couples to work together, a couple made of a young artist, usually just out of school, and some academic who were uh, working in a line of, uh, that I was interested of showing how many ways there are to assemble political uh, assemblies, if you want, uh, than the official political assemblies we call parliament. So the idea is to, is to travel again using the space of the exhibition itself to multiply the experiment of a multiplicity of ways that politic is actually achieved, even though it's not recognized as politics. Now, on the contrary, it's very important politic, but it's out of the assembly. So it could be, uh, oops, it could be, uh, well, you will see this, it could be law, it could be uh, science. I will get into that in more detail for one important reason. Um, of course, again, <laughs> there is something in the making of exhibit but I'm sure it's sure the same in many of the medium that you yourself study or use, film or theater or architecture, uh, which is the collective work of building the space inside which the experiment is going. And of course, with the complete uh, uh, uncertainty of what will the visitors uh, do in the end in, in your uh, um, sort of environment that you imagine for them. So it was built on a sort of pseudo Heideggerian argument around the notion of thing. I don't know how it works in uh, Croatian, but um, thing in English, in Russian, in um, German, in Greek, uh, in Latin, um, is first of all the name for an assembly. 
the Hess is actually the assembly and Aisha and Ding, I mean, all of his word. Uh, and here you have one of the many cases we had shown uh, historically in the show, which is what is actually assembly, called the assembly of the Ding in the Isle of Man in England, the old word for thing. And it designates not an object which is outside of politics, but on the contrary, an assembly. Is it, does it work in Croatian as well? Yes? No? <laughs> Well, some, sometimes people say no, but it's actually yes, because they forgot the etymology. If you ask an Englishman what is the meaning of the thing, they would not think immediately about the assembly, even though it's the first meaning in any dictionary. So maybe the Croatian have a word like that. I don't know about in, in Russian, I know it, it works, but I don't know. We'll see maybe in the discussion. So the idea was to build, and here, this is where the connection between art and uh, academics uh, begins to be uh, at complex, and there were many failures in this uh, exhibition and some successes, which is to build, here is a very uh, interesting experiment, which is the reconstruction of an instrument which was very important in the 17th century uh, uh, to reconstruct uh, a sort of, not a telescope, but an, a, a machinery to uh, obtain the visual display of uh, the authority out of a multiplicity of elements. And Niceron, who invented it uh, in 1632, thought it was a great and most important discovery he ever made, which was to build a machine where you, what you are outside, you see a multiplicity. And when you are in it looking through this little uh, thing here, you see uh, the unity of a sovereign. It was one of the many optical design which had been invented at the time to try to solve basically the Hobbesian question of politics. And actually, Hobbes himself uses it in his definition of a Leviathan, uh, which is actually an optical metaphor, contrary to what many people uh, imagine. So the idea was to, to do a fair where you would merge the official uh, space of politics, parliament, and uh, government, basically, into a multiplicity of other non-directly coded as political assemblages. And so, we, of course, we had some of the assembly. This is a very uh, nice print by Armin Linker, the great uh, uh, German and Italian uh, artist. So the idea was to say, OK, we, we know that we have uh, official parliament, but there are only one little part of the ways in which politics is actually done. And what are the, relig the political assemblages and the way to bring things together in all of these other uh, assemblies. What are the thing, the type of thing? Religion, of course, is one. But of course, economy, law, technical, and scientific assemblies define and determine immense part of what we call the political, but are not directly visible as uh, political. And thus, the interest of showing them in some uh, detail. And of course, this is true of science. Science is probably one of the most powerful way of assembling elements that count into the definition of politics, but they don't appear explicitly as a political uh, entity. So this is why we developed a lot of, you know, this is amazing, uh, this is not from Armin Linke, but that gives you an idea of the sort of a uh, question we were interested in. This is a poster session in a scientific uh, meeting the Neuroscientist Society in San Diego. It, it's still to this day considered as the biggest scientific poster session. And you have uh, literally thousands and thousands of posters where um, 20,000 scientists assemble to assemble the definition of the brain at this time of year. So you, you, you will not code this as political, of course, directly. But yet, if you want to know anything about the brain, you have to take into account how do you assemble the people who can actually, through posters, begin to bring together, bringing together or drawing together something like a view of the brain. And those assembly, of course, are constantly forgotten when new people begin to talk about the brain, forgetting that in order to bring, to assemble any knowledge of a brain, you need this immense numbers of assemblies and procedures that render the brain accessible. So it's exactly a case which is parallel to what people would do in politics, where everyone knows that to do politics, you need some sort of assemblage, voting system, delegation, law, etc. But 
this sort of a repertoire of analysis and critique for politics is not necessarily made for science, even though, of course, in science, many decisions, decision, quasi-political decisions made by scientists have much more influence on our life than anything politicians do in a parliament. And that's the same with the, uh, the case of economics. This is a semi-failure in my view, but it was again a, a mixture of experiment by um, um, academics and young artists trying to make, to render even supermarket into, uh, this is, I think if I remember rightly, this is the, 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 the German politically correct uh, caddy. Can you say that, caddies? The thing that you get in supermarket to bring thing, um, shopping shopping basket or something, and uh, then you had further there I forget where the the uh, left and right caddy so to speak in Germany, and it was made with a lot of little experiment and what to show that even <coughs> when you do your your shopping in a supermarket you actually do react to decisions about where you position yourself in politics, which are, of course, of enormous importance, and again, not necessarily coded as being part of a political establishment uh, in itself. So this is, again, uh, this is, of course, in the middle, the father of political art. This is Cicero, and a very beautiful piece by a Viennese artist here. So it was, it was really built as a fair, so it was not greatly successful in terms of the beauty of the exhibition, but it was very successful for the point I wanted to make. And of course, this is a tension, as you can imagine, between uh, philosophers um, and uh, curators of a, actually it's a division inside myself, uh, which is to decide if it's interesting cognitively or in terms of philosophy, but is it really good art? And in the case of this show, I'd abandoned the idea of doing great art, but I, because I wanted to get the fair element uh, stronger. So Iconoclast was an immense, beautiful exhibition, and so was the third one. But this one was not beautiful in any sort of sense, and there was no great art whatsoever. But it was exactly what I wanted as a fair, using sort of something which, of course, was criticized as being more uh, too much uh, sort of uh, expression of ID than art, which is, as you know, if you are artist here, is a great crime for uh, artists. But that's also why it's also, uh, but, sorry, this is also a way to reopen this question of the link between art and philosophy, which I was interested in. So I was not too worried by criticism. Anyway, if you are worried by criticism, you do nothing, so it's not. A, the space, see, it's not, uh, space as a fair was a very interesting and beautiful uh, space. It's a very difficult space, by the way. I don't know about here in this museum how difficult the space is. I've not visited it. But of course, exhibitions are completely dependent on the space. And this huge uh, industrial space of ZKM is uh, very, very uh, intimidating and complicated to, uh, to, to use. So let me get more time, uh, the left time, on, on something which is more recent and which is active uh, still, which is the Reset Modernity exhibition. This was built really as a different uh, uh, experiment in the experiment of thought exhibition, which was to try this time to build a space which itself was uh, a great world of art and, and build on the artist. Uh, which we had chosen with Martin Guinard, the co-curator, with a young uh, artist himself, to try to get this time uh, the whole space as an experiment into something which we call reset modernity. So reset modernity is a strange term, which uh, this is the three uh, people who work with me for the show. And the idea of reset, it, it's not, it's not, Tabula rasa, it's not uh, revolution, it's not uh, break, it's uh, something different, which is, let's think a minute, it's like a bit like, um, I don't know, if you have a, a telephone and you don't have a network anymore, you try to reset it. Actually, it's fairly difficult to reset, you have to, to call the operator to get numbers, and it's a very complicated uh, procedure. And that's why we like it, it's a procedure 
to reset your instrument so that they become sensitive again to the information that was lost before. So it's a very simple idea. It's a sort of technical metaphor, if you want. The parallel with modernity is that uh, modernity is going in so many directions and there are so many different interpretations that there is no way you can now register the signal which are sent. And of course, some of the signal um, are not going at all in the direction of modernity. So there is, there is a sort of, of, of general uh, uncertainty on the quality of our instrument to register uh, the signal what we hear. So that, so that uh, it's one large part of a sort of <laughs> distressing situation in which we find ourselves. So the idea that if, if we cannot get the signal, then we have to try to reset and see when we reset it, if we can again bring it back, so to speak. So this time we had done, and I don't know if there are people in curatorship here, an experiment which we, uh, we are told will never work, which is to equip the visitors with uh, a little uh, 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 field book, which would sim systematically do something that people are supposed to hate, which is to tell them, this is this work. We, the curator, choose this work for this reason. And now it's your turn to decide if it's a good idea or not. So we build simultaneously the experience, the works of art, the interpretation of the work of art, and uh, the counter-interpretation, so to speak, the possibility of counter-interpretation. And people say, this is horrible. You cannot possibly organize so much of a visit. Uh, but it actually works. Uh, by the way, the, this is also on my website. You can get it and download it. It's a very nice little booklet, booklet done, designed by Donato Ricci, who is a great uh, designer. But this picture <laughs> is taken the last minute of a, at the end of a, of a, of the, um, of a show. And you see that this couple is actually very seriously looking for the book. And, opening page after page and trying to use the space as an experimental space. And first time, we really do it when we equip the visitors. And the visitors is, is instructed to follow the line. But of course, precisely because it follows the line, it can think completely differently. And it, it, this is a dispute I know in curatorship. But I think this time, we, we have a proof that it could work in, in some sort of sense uh, in an interesting uh, way. So the idea was also to bring together uh, works of art and documentation to try to s format the classical debate between intellectual and artist about exhibition. Should we have too many work and too many interpretation? And how do we build it? So the idea was we, we had the works of art. This is a beautiful series by Armin Linke. But we also have a space where all the documentation was assembled so that it was clearly distinct distinct in terms of format, and distinct, of course, in terms of uh, parcours and movement inside uh, the, 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 the space. So this is, for example, one of the documentary um, series coming from lots of work I've done in the inquiry into the mode of existence. But it was also built so that you, you could, this is one of the, so we build procedures of reset. There are six procedures of reset. I'm not going to bother you with <laughs> the six. But the idea was that, OK, you arrive there in the show. You don't know what is this argument about modernity. You might have heard that it's a slightly problematic term, but basically no one has any idea about what modernity means. You are equipped with this little <coughs> catalog, field book, and you are asked, just like you would be asked to reset your telephone if you had lost the network, to go for six procedures of reset. <laughs> the idea being at the end, you have reset modernity, and you become able to register the signal you didn't register before. So this is procedure two, which is uh, one extraordinary important, of course, for modernity, which is the history of the very way in which painting and representation was itself imagined. And this is why uh, we, we build a space in which you have a certain amount of documentation here, but you have also two amazing uh, painting. It's always difficult to know how to call Jeff Wall's painting or photography uh, by uh, Jeff Wall in Hien Street. So this is the documentary part, which is a very strange attitude that the Western uh, gaze has built 
since the 17th century about the externalization of nature. And uh, this is one of the beautiful examples that Jeff Wall had uh, given us uh, in the show, where you see simultaneously the uh, beauty and extraordinary strangeness of the way we consider the relation between image and artist, uh, and in this case, anatomy. If this is uh, Adrian Walker with an uh, anatomist, I mean, arti anatomist artist, uh, the extraordinary strangeness of the gaze, the objectifying gaze of the Western uh, world. There's a, actually a complete disagreement on this image between Jeff Wall and, and, and me. Uh, I see that as a, the end of a certain way of building the space in which representation, scientific representation is possible. And he sees it as the, uh, on the contrary, a, a, glor a glory, so to speak, of uh, uh, the, the, uh, drawing and, uh, and uh, objectivity, so to speak. He sees it as a very modernist uh, painting, and I see it as, a, as the end. <laughs> but as you know, what artists think of their work is not necessarily uh, accurate. Um, and we are allowed to, <laughs> to see. But of course, we, in the catalog, I put my interpretation, and then people we could see what the way we were. But there were also, just by these images, a documentary question, I mean, an, uh, an academic and uh, an argumentative uh, little drawing which I'd ask uh, Samuel Garcia to make for me, which is the very strangeness, not only so much of the, uh, in the history of Western art, of the eye of the onlooker, but the most extraordinary, strange position you had asked the object to become, which is always forgotten in the art history critique of the Western gaze. I mean, there's a whole literature, of course, in art, in art history. But we always talk about the, the uh, one side only, which is the, the sort of point of view. And we don't talk so much about the fact that the object to be seen and prepared for the subject has been actually interrupted into its trajectory by, the, by whom? <laughs> this was the question I wanted people to raise when we are in the Jeff Hall. Who stops? Who builds the strange situation where you have object and subject? An object and subject are not in the world. There's nothing like object and subject in the world. It's a Western construction, a very specific one, invented very specifically at the turning point from the 15th century onward. And I ask uh, uh, Samuel Garcia to build, to give face to the, uh, the one who is making the connection. I mean, of course, he, he chose Le Corbusier, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's not necessary Le Corbusier. What counts here for your argument, to that you understand the argument, is, is the hand. It's, it's someone which is in the simultaneously arranging the object to be seen by the subject and arranging the, the subject so that it's actually made to be see, seeing the object. We know from a very old uh, history of art that is the subject supposed to look at is very odd. But don't forget that the object side is even odder. It's very, very strange. So this is, so I give you this as an example because first of all, it's a huge question in history of philosophy and history of science and art. But also because then the idea is, if, what does it change to the reading of the, uh, Jeff Wall, if you have this little bit of uh, argumentative drawings nearby, I mean, do you see then that there is something here which has built the situation of the ideal onlooker and the ideal object made to be an object? It's a dead mummy. It's presented with northern light here. It's presented on a screen of felt, which allows the visibility of the object to be made. And there is no way anyone can consider this as a normal representation of how, how we see and how in the world. I mean, it's a completely artificial way of being in the world. And nonetheless, this is the way in which a modernist gaze has built the object-subject uh, connections and that's the artificiality of it. So the question was, in the space of the exhibition, so now you, you can see 
the sort of experimental space. What happened to the visitors if you simultaneously see all of these uh, the, uh, different type of interaction between the Jeff wall, the Dürer, and the explanation which is behind the wall uh, there, plus the street, of course. As a, so this is to give you an idea of being in the scene, but of course it's very difficult to do that precisely because exhibition is very difficult to talk about the exhibition because uh, it's a space of experience. Oh yes, I like this, which is that uh, Samuel Garcia had the great idea of putting the, uh, the uh, see, this, this is the subject. If you, if you want to have a representation of a modernist subject, that's the best I think it is. This is it. So, 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 there, is no, there is no one, no human ever corresponding, corresponded to the subject of uh, Western philosophy. It's a, it's a nice way of summarizing the argument, so to speak. This is the other. Um. So a second procedure to give you, again, an idea and something which I'd like to discuss, actually, in the question time, because it's uh, a topic which is very important for the next exhibition which is the uh, question of the sublime. I've been very interested uh, in the question to know if the feeling of the sublime is still felt at the time of ecological mutation. That is, what happened to the spectacle of uh, ecological mutation, the spectacle of nature in traditional terms, at the time of ecological mutation? Can we register under the Aegis of a sublime, the, the, the catastrophe uh, as it was possible uh, in the 17th, 18th century when the notion of sublime was uh, un under, underlined. And the sublime, as you know, had three great elements. One of them was distance with the thing you look at. The other one was uh, in protection, really. In the Kant, Kantian definition of a sublime, you have to be out of a space. And the other thing was size. That is, you are very small, and you see the enormous size of volcanoes and icebergs and mountains and that sort of thing. And the third one was the size of your own consciousness and soul. So to feel the sublime, you have to be protected, you have to be small, and you have to be uh, in terms of morality and consciousness and responsibility much higher than all of this sort of stuff, which is immense but has no soul, so to speak. And what is interesting in the ecological uh, mutation is that the three elements have disappeared, one after the other. So we are not behind a glass. We are actually in the, the spectacle. It's not a spectacle anymore. It's moving us. We are not small, because the whole definition of the Anthropocene is that we are actually at the size of the transformation we look at, not as individual, but as a, a human race, so to speak. And of course, in terms of your own uh, morality or responsibility or higher consciousness, it's very unlikely that you are at the high scale. I mean, we feel rather petty, uh, embarrassed, and responsible. So we lose also the grandeur of our soul. So we try to build. Uh, so again, you have here the uh, in documentation space. And uh, I'm not going to go through the whole uh, work we had assembled, but this was one of the army in print, which played an important role in this uh, procedure. Because depending on the way you, you, you interpret this uh, column here of water, which is actually, um, do you see it as, do the visitors of a show interpreted, at, interpreted it as sublime or not was at stake, depending on how you look at the images. But if you know, which was said somewhere, that this is actually a very rare phenomenon which is due to the human intervention of the climate of the Mediterranean, then you get at, at suddenly you have a little shock because of, obviously, even though it looks exactly like the sort of images which were on another part of the show, uh, the sort of typical uh, 18th century images of the sublime, uh, usually volcanoes and uh, ice. And then suddenly you get the feeling that this is more that like an embarrassing figure than uh, a, a sublime feeling. So, but again, 
the nice thing with this is that we, this, is, this was the, the idea we proposed to people in the show, but they of course could have completely different view. And in my view, you can get different view only if the curator actually tells, this is my view, and then you can shift and then enter into something which is more experiential than uh, before. And we, of course, use the show itself, um, and, and very much so, as um, an experimental space. So we had many uh, art school came. If you don't know ZKM, there is a, the, um, uh, an art school just nearby. Uh, and, and we many times we try to work in the show itself to test precisely here. You see, this is the group in charge of the sublime, so to speak, try to see how the, the exhibition, uh, what is uh, demonstrated here, work or not for the visitors. This is actually for those who are in science, uh, work of art done by a great scientist, Jan Zalazivic. And we ended up with this uh, beautiful piece by uh, Territorial Agency, which was a representation of a earthly destruction by in the um, oil uh, part of the, I mean, the sort of oil um, part of the world. Okay, so the last thing I'm interested in is now, because that's connected with the exhibition I'm planning in, in 2019, which is how do we actually uh, shift if we reset modernity to a different, um, so what I call, where do we land, that is, where, where modernity was a sort of, of, of uh, movement toward a, an horizon, the horizon of a globe, but it was never exactly defined what it was made of. So the globe was not actually the best way to understand. Uh, so I'm interested, and I've been publishing many things on that, including a little book uh, next week in, in Paris. Uh, I was interested in this uh, sort of situation of a show we said modernity and then the next one, in this uh, sort of triangle, if you want. One of them is, of course, uh, the globe as, as the traditional attractor for the sake of which we were supposed to modernize. That is, every modernizing effort was made to get us out of this uh, sort of small provincial archaic uh, territory, if you want. The sacrifice we had to undergo in the last three centuries was to move like this, along this line, so to speak. And to be modern was to move like this. To be reactionary was to move like that, OK? If you want to a simplification of the we have never been argument. But what, what is interesting now is that this attractor, the globe, as not only not exactly disappear, but has become negative instead of positive. So if, if I'm asking you about globalization, I'm sure you would have completely different reaction because we don't know if globalization means the multiplication of ways of being on this land or the diminution of the numbers of ways of being uh, 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 together, so to speak. So there is there's a globalization plus and the globalization minus. And we don't know which one is the right one <clears throat> because for most of us in Europe, what is called mondialization, globalization, is actually a decrease of the numbers of ways in which to behave economically, legally, etc. And what is very troubling, and of course I'm saying that with some uh, hesitation here in, uh, in uh, Croatia and in uh, Belgrade, and, or in France or Italy and Germany, is that since this one is going to disappear, so to speak, the reaction is to say, OK, well, let's go back to this one. Let's give us back the ancient identity we had, nationally or ethnically or religiously. Because we, we sort of accepted to lose it because we were moving to the globe and in the name of modernization. But if the modernization ideal is disappearing, then let's at least have an identity back, so to speak. And most of what we are seeing now with the Brexit, what we are seeing with Trump, what we are seeing in, um, in Germany, in France slightly less, but for, by chance, so to speak, um, and that we see, of course, in those countries around here, is that 
the tension, the temptation is to say, well, at least here we have the identity that the globe is not going to give us. So all this question about resetting modernity is not an academic question. It's a very practical one. Why? Because probably there is another attractor, which I call the Earth or Gaia, whatever the term. And this attractor is very actually difficult to define because it has very different characteristics than the one. Uh, it's certainly not the globe, even though it is global, it's mo mondial. But it's not, of course, the identity and the narrow uh, ethnic delimitation. But it has a lot of local aspect also to it. And that's why everyone is very puzzled, not knowing if the interest for the Earth is a return of the archaic and the local, or is it a sort of transformation and a deep transformation of the mondial. And that's the situation I'm interested in exploring through exhibition. Uh, and of course, in the show, in one of the procedure, we had a quite nice and beautiful moment when you saw simultaneously Tassi Tadi and Riste Dubert uh, in the same. Uh, my instruction to the, my colleague was to try to build a space where you, you had really the feeling of landing. That is, we more and more attention was paid to the soil. And as you know, there are endless numbers of exhibitions now um, and in all sorts of form and forms around the return of the soil, to the, which is very funny because soil was supposed to be a reactionary attractor, so to speak. And suddenly, people realize that the soil is actually uh, very important but very difficult to define. And it ended up with uh, this amazing um, um, piece of work by um, uh, uh, Pierre Huyg, the Nymphéa transplant, which played uh, <laughs> somewhat far uh, with the uh, very traditional impressionist painting. But as you see, this is not longer an impressionist painting that you can see flat. It's a very beautiful and important and interesting work of art, and an highly complex one. We had lots of trouble with these little guys here because it turned out that the Germans are protecting their animals very carefully. And we had to make sure that these animals were not working more than 10 hours a day. <laughs> um, so we had to go through endless numbers of commissions and to say, well, we will stop the, them working. And we have to build all sorts of things here. Anyway, this is the normal thing with exhibition. By the way, I think this is Peter Weibel is here. So the idea is that the third attractor looked more like this, like a Pierre Wig piece. But of course, it's very difficult to realize what is the thickness and what is the exact view. And I'm working a lot now with scientists and artists on that uh, question. Um, I have a better drawing here. However, no, if I one more minute, I want to bring, bring our fourth attractor, because in, since I draw this, we have a fourth attractor here. Which, is, uh, which was not planned when we did the exhibition, but which is Mr. Trump, which is somewhere here. And Trump is interesting because he invented a position where he promised simultaneously the return to the land and extreme capitalism to the same people, which is completely impossible. On, only, it's possible only if he denies this question of the Earth transformation. So the political situation, I think, now, in terms of anthropology of the modern, is that we are taken in between this four position. This one is attracting only Trump and his buddies, but uh, it has a very important uh, element of uh, um, fanatism about it, because it's built on the negation of a climate transformation. And that's why I'm interested in Trump very much. Because if you follow the fourth attractor, and then you take a line, you see that, in fact, Trump is in the good direction. Trump is a great ecologist. You just have to do exactly the opposite of what he does, and then you end up at the right attractor, which is here. But this attractor is not the globe, and it's not the land. And thus, all the political position which had been articulated here, and this idea between, which are basically the left and right, let's say, and the difficulty that ecologists had to place themselves, are we left or right? We never knew exactly where they were. Are we left for more, more as, or left or, and right for economy? I mean, it's a complete mess because we are, in fact, 
also interrogating ourselves what would be to actually land here. And that mobilized everyone in science, of course, in politics and in uh, science. I think that's why, uh, and in art. So this is why uh, exhibition seems to me the one of very, very powerful way to build uh, a sort of description, of, uh, sorry, of a space. So this is, this is uh, one of my friend, Arena, uh, Alexandra Aren, who tried to, to do a better diagram than my diagram. This, this is very different from this and that, but it has features of both except we have not been equipped to recognize the complete originality of this uh, attractor here, and that's the, the difficulty. So I'm, I'm now starting a series of exhibitions, smaller exhibitions, this one is in Shanghai, and a new one in Iran, to try to build on this experience of resetting modernity and trying to find a way to understand collectively where we will land, which is also the title of this uh, book here. Thank you very much. <laughs>